Welcome to Turku. This is Round the Channel and here we are by Turku Castle. Very famous place. We had a little bit of a talk with Archgoat, the famous black metal band about Satan and whatnot. How is this related to this particular interview? Well, we're gonna talk about some Satan and music with this band from a genre known as doom metal and then some. Welcome uh, River Bizarre and many other bands. Kimi Karki, welcome to Round the Channel. How are you doing, sir? Thanks. Uh, I'm doing actually quite good right now. Um, been having a very relaxed holiday lately and uh, kind of slowly returning to work and also making music and so on. And even had a live performance last Saturday. So, yeah, looking better. Talking about live performances, everybody knows that this 2020, in case you're checking out this interview in, in five years or whatever, this will be remembered as the year of the corona epidemics. And the that, plague. The plague. <laughs> and that has particularly uh, affected so many live gigs, fests and all that things getting cancelled. And obviously some bands have the livelihood with the bands, some are merely for the hobby, but nevertheless culture has been taken a big hit, we could say. Yeah. How has it affected your musical endeavors? Yeah. Well, uh, Kind of when we started uh, this this disease, uh, I was doing a live uh, tour with Lord Vicar, my current doom metal band, and we were the last gig was in a club called Helvet in North Rhine Westphalen area in Germany, and um, it was Saturday night, and there were maybe 45, 50 people, and we were, what the fuck is going on here? It's like usually we have quite good crowds in, mm -hmm. in Germany, and then someone told that this is really bad area for this new virus and of course we knew that it existed in Germany but then we realized that we had come to the part of the darkness and uh, right after I returned to Finland I went to quarantine for a couple of weeks luckily I didn't get anything from there and nobody in the band either but it kind of uh, hit me right at home that yeah. this is quite bad and uh, of course a lot of stuff was cancelled and the one thing that really pissed me off was that we were supposed to have this wonderful midsummer festival in the Alps. Oh, it yeah. Is, uh, House of the Holy Festival in uh, Abdenau in uh, Austria. And I was supposed to have both a band gig and a solo performance there. But of course, the kind of uh, good side is that they just decided to postpone it by a year. So hopefully next midsummer we will be having some action in the Alps. All right. Uh now that people should learn about basic facts about Mr. Kim Karki here is that he's an active uh, artist, a musician of many, many different bands, uh, current projects and also the past ones. And uh, we kind of got, got this idea that we could do this interview in like, like uh, three different parts as the Greek philosopher and the man of science, Aristotle, who I guess said that there is the arc of drama you have the first part, the mid part, and the end part. So, in order to respect or honor this idea, we're gonna first talk about the past endeavors, mainly Reverend Bizarre, which is, by the way, um, kind of a requested interview by some of you right there. And then we're gonna talk about the ongoing, the current projects and bands. And then in the end, we'll go to non-metal area. Something special, I hope. But now that we introduced this idea, Let's talk about River Bizarre. It didn't exist too many years. I mean, you had uh, a decade and then some. Yeah. But totally a uh, very, very active career. Like Metal Archives lists some 25 different releases, including demos, three full length albums, splits, EPs. Did you burn out? Uh, I didn't, but I guess our bass player singer kind of a little bit did. Uh, he was also doing other projects that mm -hmm. he, he really wanted to expand, uh, not only doing that band. And that was, I think, part of the decision why we uh, kind of finished the band was that he wanted to do so many other things. And this band was become, kind of starting to consume him because it was kind of getting bigger. Yeah. Yeah, we, it was almost feeling like we were breaking through to this kind of next level there and then he thought that he doesn't need that shit. <laughs> yeah, to, to me it seems like kind of an outsider if you will. I mean most people know I guess at least me and the channel as a black metal, death metal guy. But I mean of course all metal genres are interesting and they kind of overlap. 
But even from my perspective, being not a kind of a doom metal specialist, if you can call it that, uh, it seemed like you guys were going mainstream, like, and not in a bad way, by the way, just, you know, all those releases and people uh, praising your music, obviously yeah. really, really well appreciated and well respected music. So you were uh, growing big and people were like, yeah, I love this band. I mean, trail taking the tradition back to, the, to this day. And yes. then no more. So obviously your other bands, which we're going to talk a little bit, uh, kind of a continued the legacy, it seems, but you had to split the ways. Is there or was there any kind of a drama with these changes, how the end suddenly came and all that? Of course there's always drama and as people we three, uh, Alberto, Sami and then Yara or Earl of Boyd, the drummer, we were all very different personalities and we didn't hang together too mm -hmm. much. It, it, was not, it, was, it was a kind of brotherhood but very strange one because we, we had always this kind of love and hate vibe going on. and. Um, I mean, I was a family man with a uh, university career and uh, Sami is this kind of hermit figure, very creative and passionate about his ideas and driven, but kind of outsider yeah. person. And then Yara was kind of doing activism and kind of vegan and straight edge scene and hardcore scene and so on. So we were kind of bonded by the music, if you like, and we, we all shared this idea of do metal how it should be done, but we were also kind of, especially after the start, we also tried to expand on that and kind of go a little bit avant-garde, but it's funny, the more crazy we got with the music, the more uh, kind of recognition we got, so it's like, um, instead of having to compromise to gain any success. We, we were kind of trying to dig deeper into our hole and people like that. Yes. It was very, of course, it was rewarding because we didn't have to sacrifice anything of our principles and yeah. ethos. You just went forward with your own idea and making your own path, basically. Yeah, exactly. So people who are not aware of this band, because I mean, for a younger generation, maybe those born in less than 30 years ago, might not know the band, even though you might have heard the name. The thing here is, these guys went very much into the tradition of doom metal, but like you, you explained, you also had some other ideas. And you also incorporated lots of uh, different ideas. First of all, you were not shy of using the traditional uh, Christian crosses in the logo, which is kind of a, well, doom legacy in of a way. It, it's totally in there, yes. because starting from Black Sabbath. Exactly. Yeah. But you also had uh, like uh, names like Satan included in the uh, some of the release titles and all that. So you were very much into this kind of a could we say Christian mythicism or at least the ideas of like biblical themes or whatever. It what was, can you tell about it? It's it's like it's an aesthetic. It's the graveyard aesthetic. It's the gothic. It's the horror, and um, it's also the sickness of uh, mainstream religion. We try to kind of. Uh, in a way it was a mockery of that and there was very conscious spiritual schizophrenia going on like good is evil and evil is good kind mm -hmm. of thing so uh, people confused us first because we were wearing crosses mm -hmm. right from the beginning that changed a little bit later but uh, people thought that are they a Christian band that didn't come with this conception yes um, which didn't matter for us because we were searching to confuse people and um, yeah and and in that regard we thought that we just go with whatever we feel comfortable about and we felt comfortable about quite many things. Yeah, I think I have this vague recollection. I think my band back the night side and Reverend Bizar played at the same venue. Uh, I think it was PVO. Yeah, which uh, would be yeah. probably <laughs> late nineties. And I I remember actually. I think it was a drummer, but I'm not totally sure. This was more than 20 years ago now. But there was this like Christian cross logo or, or, or something. And we obviously had the inverted ones. And I remember for a, like a short moment, there was like these eyes, you know, meeting the gaze and like, what is going on here? Because the obvious kind of a misunderstanding, which is very typical for the Gothic themes in, in, in doom metal, having those crosses. And I remember I was like, trying to figure out like, are these guys Christians or is it some doom metal legacy or what is going on? And we never spoke about it. And I mean, I don't even know the drummer guy, but anyway. Yeah. Th this he is had a massive cross. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, he was wearing this kind of chain. It, it must have been that one. It's about like... Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that must have been it. And I remember going through this idea. Now, if we go backwards instead of uh, future about these kind of uh, concept, concepts of doom metal and the logos and symbols used, um, what is your own um, feeling or interpretation about this uh, Christian cross logo being used throughout the uh, doom history? I mean, it started with Black Sabbath, and I, I think by this week, of I think it was Gerald Garner who gave the crosses to them mm -hmm. for protection. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, especially Jesus Butler, the bass player, was uh, who was, I guess, kind of the main lyricist in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, he was dabbling with a lot of the hammer horror imagery. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, he, he kind of thought that, oh yeah, uh, we, we are talking about darkness and doom and so on. Of course, the inverted cross in the, I think it was either the first or second Sabbath album, but they had that in the gatefold there. Um, and that was, of course, the record company, and they were not very happy about it. And I, I think then Tony Iommi came up with uh, After Forever, which is kind of Christian song, mm. if you like. So uh, even with them, it was kind of schizophrenic. In, yeah, kind in of terms, a vague. Yeah, it's like there's this evil darkness coming and this black figure. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they are like horrified and need the protection of the crosses. And that imagery kind of became kind of totem for the whole doom metal community later. Uh, don't you see, uh, I mean, do you see a reason why nobody, basically nobody, I mean, the big names of doom metal challenged this view. I mean, why did they all decide to go with it? Is it the same thing that in black metal, like, if somebody used to inverted cross, we must do the same? Mm -hmm. Or what, what, why is it so much kind of a going with the tradition or copycatting? Of course, it's not that simple. There's bands like Pentagram were totally mm -hmm. satanic in mm -hmm. their imagery. I mean, they used the uh, inverted pentagram and the goat symbolism mm -hmm. and so on. And kind of the songs were also very satanic. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, then you had bands like Trouble who were calling themselves white metal and yeah. kind of talking about Golgotha and crucifixion and Jesus and so on. So you had, I, I don't think there is this kind of rule. So it's not unified. Metal. No, it's absolutely not. Even musically, it's like, a lot of those bands are very different. It's like if you think about the kind of new wedding of British heavy metal style band like um, Witchfire in general, who mm -hmm. then again have this kind of puritanic, puritanic Christianity imagery there, yeah. starting from the horror film. Yeah, the they, movie. Yeah, yeah Michael yeah. Reeves film, uh, which is a classic, classic, by the way. Yes. Um, I mean, they kind of took their aesthetic from that. And I mean, in the cover art they have naked ladies in the graveyard and these priests are kind of uh, torturing them and stuff yeah. like that so there is that schizophrenia there as well uh, so uh, and musically they were kind of more like new wave of British heavy metal and then you had these bands that were really slow or mm -hmm. uh, I mean th there's a lot of variety in the scene well, what is the thing with doom metal I mean the part where you just kind of have to have slow tempo it's almost like the uh, synonymous to the whole genre. I mean, in many styles, we death metal, be trash metal, be black metal, or any kind of metal, you have different tempos, but doom metal is mainly dominated by this one rule that ruled them all. And now we have a biker coming. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Hey, hey. So back to the very <laughs> question. Um, why, why, it's, why the slow tempo is the number one rule that everybody must follow? I think it's more about the in intensity than slowness per se. I mean, of course, there are kind of, if we think about how doom metal has been kind of uh, subgenre, like to death doom, which is basically slowed down death metal, mm -hmm. which then again, traditional doom metal is like us, we were kind of, that's not real doom metal. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember lots of pure time talk about yeah. which is the true, true traditional know, doom. Fuck stoner rock and all yeah. this, this is too lazy and, and too And my doing is too death metal yeah, and yeah. all that stuff. I mean, I have to say when I get older, I kind of, I, I just like good music. But back then we were also trying to, because nobody was kind of recognizing the traditional doom mm -hmm. metal. It was also the mission was to bring that great music back for people's minds. Yeah. So that was part of the provocation to be a little bit more extreme about the opinions and interviews and so on. Uh, but I think more than slowness, it's about this certain kind of aesthetic. And for me, doom metal is about the intensity. It's not about like how slow you can play, but how hard you can hit and then be in the pocket. All right. Yeah. All right. Back to the very basics of the band before we go to your other ventures. Uh, 
how the name came to be. It's already kind of a biblical reference. I mean, it's reverend, yeah. but then again, it's also bizarre. It kind yeah. of fits you perfectly. Why such a name? Uh, of course, Albert or Sami, I mean, he, he got, got the name and um, it's basically, it's part of uh, kind of reference to cathedral, the Colonel Bizarre, but especially it's the religious idea of having the reverend, the good, and the bizarre, bad, but the bizarre being good and the reverend being bad. So it's just so like that's, twisting. That's why we have those crosses and then kind of inverted cross as well. Um, and the sixes in the logo, yeah. if you know this, uh, which is kind of another nod to the tradition. And um, another thing, kind of, he already had the titles for most of the albums, I think, and the first one was In the Rectory of the Bizarre Reverend. And that's a kind of both a tribute and kind of mockery to King Crimson and their debut album in the court of the Crimson King, which is a reference to mm. Satan. The Crimson, King Crimson is Satan. Never thought of that, I must admit. Yeah. All right, but your other ventures, I mean, you've kind of continued with the legacy musically, Lord Vicar and other projects, yeah. and you have even played with your ex reverend Bizarre drummer in another project. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've actually played with both of them in another project. I mean, yeah. I mean, Sami was singing for Orne and uh, uh, Yara was playing the drums for it, the progressive rock band. We, we, we've done two albums for Italian label called Black Widow Records. And both of them have in different times played in Lord Vicar. Okay. So it's like uh, we still get along. And I, I think because we buried the Reverend Bisa, we are still uh, good friends mm -hmm. and can still like, uh, we, when we decided to separate, the last gigs were a big celebration for us. And uh, kind of, there was this bond that cannot be broken very easily. We kind of, of course, whenever you have a band that stays together for a long time, it's mm -hmm. like you put a bunch of rocks into this kind of maybe to the ocean and then it's being uh, gr grinded, grinded, grinded until maybe the hardest edges fall off and you kind of start to recognize each other's uh, personalities. We of course always had a little bit uh, of tension there, which was part of, I think, of the chemistry that there was this kind of intensity. So kind of a love-hate yeah. bond in a way. Well, always present. and. When I think about those two other guys as personalities, they were very different, but the same in the sense that they were perfectionists. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, you know, Spinal Tap where there's fire and ice, and I'm the lukewarm water in the middle. So uh, I was kind of looking at it, and they were having arguments about arrangements or something like uh, nanosecond there, and they were thinking whether this is all right, and no, let's do it again. And I was, and sometimes it got quite hostile as well. and. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I tried to just like, let's fucking play and... Um, but of course, because they were so strict about everything, also the records are very well produced and uh, there's no lazy, lazy jamming there, but every detail has been thought out very carefully. And now we have part two of the biking thing. Yeah. This time behind the camera. Uh, let's talk about Lord Vicar then. It is yeah. mostly seen, I guess, your own project where others just came to you like a magnet. Is this true or how it is? Um, of course, I, I mean, when Reverend Bizarre ended around 2006, 2007, um, I was like, shit, I have good songs that I, mm -hmm. I still want to record. And I, 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 I was the only one basically in the band that loved playing live. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Sami likes to play live when he's doing like bass, but when he's like the front man, he, he doesn't like that. That much getting to the focus and yeah. limelight. Oh, oh, that's another love hate thing. I think he he like he he is a very theatrical person and very mm -hmm. strong live performer. I'm amazingly strong live performer, but it's not something that he takes enjoyment of. It's more like he has to do certain yeah. things. But for kind me, a responsible in a way. Yeah, I, I I love playing live and having that raw energy of interaction with the live audience. And I, I thought that I I want to have an active lineup to play more of this kind of music. I didn't think that I should play those songs. I, I thought that, okay, we, we buried this band and we all had, after we reached that conclusion, we all were like, yeah, this is like no fucking reunions or anything. This is it. And uh, well, I, I, I think I visited one, one song later, but 
other than that, we haven't touched that legacy. Except when we played in Greece in this uh, Greek wedding. All right, well, afterwards. What's the story? Yeah, I mean, there was a couple who met at our gig in Athens and later got married uh, in a town called Kavala to, uh, to east from Thessaloniki and the husband decided that, okay, we need to have Reverend Bizar getting back together for the wedding party and then we st decided that we're going to play a Sodoma Sunrise. All right. That was the kind of title, which is one of our songs. and. Um, so we, we kind of played in an after party there and we had amazingly great time because the Greek hosts were amazing and we had our own apartment there, beer and barbecue and stuff like that. So it was a pretty cool thing to do. And um, I know, yeah, we played as the last band in Teveo before it shut down. Yeah, yeah that's a, by the way, a classic small venue run by some university organization or Whatever yeah. it's officially Which was called. started in fifties, and then they just decided that it has to go, and uh, then then they closed it down. Of course, it later reopened in another place and had to close there as well. But yeah. let's see what the time kind of. I hope that the saga will continue at some point. But anyway, we kind of had this a uh, couple of uh, very very crazy little shows, but other than that, we decided that's it. And then Lord Vicar, kind of. I, I thought that. I, I need some kind of creative outlet and and it was actually Sami, I think, he, he said that what about Chris Linderson? Um, he had been very silent for a while. I mean, he was a very well-known figure in the scene. He had sung in Count Raven and St. Vitus and we actually saw him live with Terra Firma, his later band, and I, I thought that's an amazing frontman. And uh, so I decided to continue, contact him and knew some of the Count Raven guys, mm -hmm. so that I, I got contact to them. And, and he's also a little bit older. I mean, yeah. he's 50 plus. Yeah. We are just merely 40 something. Yeah, 44 now. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we decided to, or I decided to continue, contact him. And uh, then, then I went to Stockholm to meet him. And we had a, we drank some ale from the horn and decided this is, this is it. Kind of Viking Brotherhood thing. And um, Garrett, the drummer, he he was uh, in a band called Centurion's Ghost and was playing drums for them. And we toured the last tour in Europe with Reverend Bizarre West with them as support, one of the super supports there. And um, basically, he just said that if you need a drummer, I'll come. And I thought oh, he's a fantastic person. We shared very much the musical um, kind of vision. Uh, vision, yeah, and all like a lot of the same bands as well and so I thought he would be a great match and he has been yeah yeah and and so so it kind of got together how do you yeah. practice i mean you have have to have rehearsals every now and then obviously yeah. but you all live quite uh, far away yeah. from each other how does it happen in the days of yeah. modern internet and all do you just remotely rehearse or do you just get together and we, get we shit done. We don't really rehearse that much. It's like, um, I mean, I, we used to have another Finn in the band, Jussi, who played the bass. Uh, and now we have a Brit in the bass who lives uh, kind of north from Bristol. Yeah. Garrett, he's a Brit, but he lives in Switzerland, in Basel. <laughs> so and you're all different countries. We, we have four different countries, so it's really impossible. So before the recordings, uh, we try to get together somehow, at least some of us. Uh, like in Barcelona, Stockholm or Turku and um, usually before the tours we try to get one rehearsal in the morning of the first show so that we get the rust away a little bit but I have to say it's like we, we do have a very good chemistry so after a couple of songs we kind of gel together and yeah. know what to do but um, I have to say that usually in tours if you wanna see us play live, a really good show, you come to the maybe the fourth or fifth show or sixth, whatever it's yeah. like, then you... You're like an oiled machine by that time. Yeah, it's like, then it becomes kind of natural in the sense that you don't think what you do, but it's more like... It, getting to the flow, maybe? Yeah, getting to the flow, togetherness, and you are not doing it with the brain anymore, but the whole body is functioning and kind of, we, we become a unit, yeah. What about your solo project, which goes by your own name? How yeah. different it is to combo songs for that versus Lord of Icar, Reverend Bizarre and other bands? I always compose with an acoustic guitar, even the metal stuff. 
So it's like, for me, I mean, I, I think in terms of riffs and melodies, and I, it has to be strong enough to, you know, keep my attention even with an acoustic guitar. So that's like mm -hmm. the test. Yeah. Test, and of course the live audience is another test, but uh, with the solo project, it's acoustic folk basically. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I'm not a much of a singer. I'm not a much of a player. I like to write songs. And then when I go to this kind of more personal area, I thought that this is something, a mountain I have to climb. I wanted to challenge myself as a player. Yeah. So I thought that what's more naked than getting naked is that you only have your acoustic guitar and your voice. Good point. And there's nothing you can fake in that situation. It's yeah. either you live it or you die it. You know? Yeah. It's like a bad karaoke stars. Yeah. You make I mean, it. I'm, I'm you a fake bad it karaoke until you... <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. You fake it until you make it. Yeah. Um, if you had to select only one of your babies to have in your legacy box sent to space, of all your bands, all your projects, you could just pick one discography maybe, or maybe even one album, one release, and the legacy box was sent to space, and you're like, Man, I have all these bands I've loved or loved, but I can pick only one. I know choosing only one baby can be difficult, but it's what would it be, be at this yeah, very moment? It's, it's, I mean, I know that I will be remembered from Reverend Bizarre because it just was so big in, in comparison. But for me, the dearest band is Lord Vicar because it's something that we all, we all had done bands before. Mm -hmm. So it was like, People were calling us a super band, and at the same time, it's like people were comparing us to our past. If you know what I mean, it's it's a very big challenge to overcome that and finding your own identity. And I think we very much did that. And we have our own sound, and we basically, in, if we think in terms of musical aesthetic, it, it's a combination of. Uh, slow doom metal, riff rock, classic rock, progressive rock, acoustic folk. I mean, these are the kind of different elements that go into that band. And at the same time, it sounds only like Lord Vicar. So I, I guess in that sense, I'm very proud of what we achieved with that band. And also it's the band where I have had the easiest in terms of um, how I get along with the other members. And uh, I think in this age, you kind of like the comfort. It's not comfort, but it's more like trust. You All know right. that, okay. yeah. yeah. Of course, we have had our <laughs> drunken adventures with that band as well. We are all, we have all been there and kind of rode the snake. But uh, I think in terms of this kind of feel-good factor when you play live, it's like it feels like your teeth each when you. There, there's such kind of uh, good feeling. Even when the music is incredibly dark at times, you have this incredible spiritual lift from it and the energy that comes up when the live performance is going really well. I love that. That is a question now that I w definitely want to ask, which is not too often discussed, but especially with the uh, so-called extreme metal, and I would count doom metal being part of it, that. Doom metal, metal, dead metal, yeah, yeah. trash metal, black metal, and all those different hybrids. People often, especially outside the metal, are like, Okay, so you're this kind of a feel-good, nice, nice person and all that stuff. How come you play such dark music? What is wrong with your wiring in your head? And I'm like, man, I get the good stuff out of it. Doesn't matter how dark, how much it's about death, suicides, torture, yeah. or whatever darkness, end of the world. But yeah. what it is for you? Why, why dark music talking to you in yeah. these special ways? I think it's about that music crowns me in a way that I, I feel the earth and the, the solid heaviness of the material. It gives me physical vibrating pleasure. And at the same time, this darkness also works as an exorcism for me. I mean, I'm a relatively easygoing and happy person, but part of that is that I let go of a lot of like inner darkness. So it's music. basically vending the shit out. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. You're also a man of culture in other ways than just music. Can you um, tell tell the audience a little bit about your career? You mentioned this academic career earlier, and uh, you are a reading man in so many ways. What can you tell about this cultural career you're having and how it's related to music? Yeah, I mean, music is a very, very serious 
hobby for me. So it's it's not something I get my living out of. I don't think many people do, and if they do, they suffer for it. Uh, I'm an academic. My profession, I, I studied cultural history as my main main subject, uh, also uh, cooperative religion and philosophy. And I graduated and then I did my doctoral thesis on popular music history. And I then became docent, which is kind of, uh, after the doctorate, you can do this kind of specialized uh, thing uh, on um, um, kind of culture, cultural studies and um, um, what do you call it? I'm actually having a blackout now. Kulturi um, perintä. Kind of cultural heritage. Cultural sorts? heritage. Yes, that's that's exactly the field. And um, cultural heritage studies is uh, something that I relate to popular culture studies, and that's kind of my niche in, in the academic world. And I've written a lot about live performance of bands and even stadium rock and this kind of more extreme uh, cultural phenomena like fascism in popular culture and so on. And I. Well, I've co-edited a book on history of Turku rock and roll. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of different things. Now, one thing people need to know, I, I think it's maybe it's personal thing, but I think it's kind of important. Uh, Miyamoto Musashi, one of the well, the most famous swordsman in in Japanese history, probably in the world, if there was this kind Going of a collecting. Co the book of five rings. I yeah. Love that. If yeah. there was this collective uh, knowledge base for swordsmanship, he would be probably ranked like. The Arnold Schwarzenegger of swordsmanship. And he, he, he fought more than 60 duels and never got a defeat. Other exactly. Than, yeah. And why this is mentioned is that he created this uh, idea or ideal of a uh, poet warrior. You have to have this kind of a physical side. You're a warrior, you're a soldier, maybe, Ronin, I guess. Yes. But you also a samurai have... without a master in the exactly. Sense, yeah. But you also have to have this kind of artistic side. Maybe writing poets, maybe doing music, arts in general. And you also have your other side of this culture. You do martial arts. Yes. What can you tell about this background a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I got into it as a little kid. Uh, I used to live in this little town called Lohja, and that's where Reverend Bisa got started as well. But uh, I was doing judo. And uh, I was reading a lot of martial art, arts books. It, this was early 90s, basically, and uh, I, I got into it uh, very much then. But the dojo training didn't go anywhere, so I quit after a while. But I had re read a book about Aikido by this uh, Finnish sensei called Petteri Silenius, Aikido Harmonisa Voimantis, which means basically uh, this kind of uh, path of harmony, strength in harmony kind of thing and I, I was very impressed about the ideas in that book and um, later, very much later, uh, in my late 30s, I, I basically saw a brochure at the coffee table of our department in the university which said that there's a, basically a, a course on Aikido, basic training and the main teacher in the dojo was the same Peter Silenus. I thought, okay, this is a sign. Finally, I, I get to witness this art from the inside a little bit. And I, I went and haven't looked back. So that's my main main art. I'm also very interested in uh, balance training and uh, kind of unified body movement, th these kind of things, Qi Kung and uh, so on. Uh, but Aikido is the, the main art that I practice. And now I have asked a special request to uh, perform some Moves up to you, like favorite techniques, maybe three favorite techniques you could do on me. Uh, don't be afraid. I have had my own uh, background in martial arts. It's, it's not gonna kill me. Maybe uh, broke a little few things. I'm just joking aside. Oh. We'll, we'll we'll move to the lawn and we'll do some Aikido stuff for just fun and the sake of it. So this would be called Yodan Tsuki Uchikaiten Sankyo. So if you hit me in the head, so I block it, put it to the ribs. Atemi here, or a real strike. Then go down, lock you, take you down. And then here there's a control. Yeah. All right. And, and the, if you grab my hand. Which, yeah, which hand? Grab any, it doesn't matter, that's fine. This is called kotegaishi basically. So it's a, another wrist turn lock. You take it from here and you can either lock it from up here or you can come down 
move your head to the other side, otherwise it's like being kicked. Yeah, and then you lock it from here. Yeah, so there's a variety for you. And now some ukemis, which are kind of like uh, falling safely. Falling safely in a oriental way. Uh, maybe if you kind of go, uh, go down, go down. Yeah. Like? Uh, yeah. No, no, uh, just on your knees. On yeah, your knees. On your knees, okay. And then down, uh, like this. Exactly. This is called Topikoshi Ukemi. So you can go. There you go. That's a one very basic way to fall from across some kind of obstacle. So basically... Yeah, exactly. And because we wanted to do some uh, goofy way of uh, say goodbyes, we're gonna go in that direction. So see you later with next interview. Thank you. Cheers.